Anglican public worship and gatherings are suspended until further notice uh, in order that the church may protect all, one and all from the rapid transmission of this disease. Our parish family includes all sorts and conditions of people. We have vulnerable children, seniors, those with health complications, those who are facing loss of income, and challenged work situations, as well as those who have been laid off. Some of you may be seriously wondering how you are going to hope cope with these unfolding days. We know that there are many needs within our community right now. Over the past two weeks, we have been in contact with many of you by the telephone. And even though our building is closed, we are here for you. We know that we have more phone calls to do. And if you haven't heard from the church in this way, please stay tuned. Every household of our congregation will also receive a pastoral mailing in the coming week with greetings from me, details about Holy Week and Easter services, as well as an operational and financial report from our church wardens. We have honestly endeavored to provide answers for your most frequently asked questions. Perhaps you are feeling isolated, lonely, vulnerable, and afraid. Perhaps you are dealing with challenges with how you will get groceries or medications. Perhaps you have questions, or you just need someone to talk to you. If this is the case, please don't hesitate to reach out either to myself or to the Reverend Michelle Jones. We would be glad to talk with you. Please be patient with us as we continue to adapt to this new situation, endeavoring to provide through the use of technology, worship, prayer, study, and pastoral care. This new normal in the midst of an unfolding, challenging situation is the new normal. Today is the fifth Sunday of Lent. We continue our Lenten journey through the disciplines of prayer, fasting, giving of alms, and the reading and reflecting upon God's holy word. We are grateful for those who continue faithfully through pre-authorized giving and those who have given through Canada House. Look soon for an option in which you may make an offering to the Lord through the use of your debit card. And details and instructions will be available on our website. We gather today using smartphones in homes, with TVs, computers, and all sorts of devices in order that in this physically distant way we may draw close to each other as we draw close to our merciful, loving, and living God who promises to abide with us even in times of stress. Please remember to pray for your church leaders and for our civic leaders who are doing the best they can in the midst of difficult situations. Lastly, please pray for the vulnerable, the sick, the homeless, the anxious, and the needy. And please pray for the ministry of Christ Church Brampton as we endeavor to serve them. I invite you now to turn in your service leaflet as our worship continues as we pray together the Collect for Purity. Let us pray. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Dear friends, as we prepare to worship Almighty God, let us with penitent and obedient hearts confess our sins, that we may obtain forgiveness by his infinite goodness and mercy. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. 
We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and bring you to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now I invite uh, the children to come closer to the television set because we have a great children's message for you. And if your kids aren't with you, put your TV on pause and call them to come and worship with you. Well, good morning. So this morning, since you are there, I have Mo here with me. Most of you are familiar with Mo from day camp, so he's going to help me this morning. So I don't know, we're just going to get to see here, how many of you at home are playing games? Well, some of you might be playing this game. This is Dominoes, and it's a fun game because you get to connect the dots. But there's another thing that you can do with Dominoes that's really cool. And that is that if you move one when they're set up like this, what happens? Hmm. They all fall down. What if I wanted the first one here just to fall? And if I was to knock it over, all of them would go. But what would happen if I wanted the one at the very end to fall. How would I do that? Well, you probably already know the answer, but Mo's going to help me with that. If I want the one at the end to fall, he would push, let's hope this works, the first one. And it worked. That meant that what I wanted happened at the very end. And sometimes that happens with us and God. We think that something should happen, or we want something to happen. And sometimes it doesn't happen. And we have to remember that God has his own plans. And we may not see that right away, but we'll see that a little bit later. In our gospel, we hear about Jesus, who had a friend, Lazarus, who passed away, passed away. Now, the disciples were curious why Jesus didn't run and rush to his friend while he was, when he heard he was sick. And Jesus had his reasons. Now, the disciples wanting him to go and rush back to a sick friend, that was the kind thing for to, to do, and the right thing to do. But they also knew that they had to believe in Jesus. And so they followed Jesus and they waited. And what that meant was that he arrived and Lazarus had passed away. And what that meant was that Jesus could bring Lazarus back to life. And that was his plan, because people saw what he had done, and they believed in God. But what also happened was there were other people who saw what he had done and started to plot to kill Jesus. And that meant that Jesus was crucified and was raised from the dead. So even though we didn't know when Lazarus was sick and we wanted to rush to him, they wanted to rush to him, they didn't see the end picture of God's big plan. And for us today, there are things that we may not understand. And God does tell us to pray for things that we think are right and do things that are right. But when those things don't happen, not to worry or be disappointed. Because God, he's got this. He knows what will happen at the end. So we need to put our trust and our faith 
in him. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you. We thank you that you know what's in our hearts, what's in our minds, and what's going to help happen. And help us to be calm and put our faith in you. In Jesus' name, amen. And you shall know that I am the Lord, 
when I open your grace and bring you up from your grace, O oh my people. I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live. And I will place you on your own soil, then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks. 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 Oh 
Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his, his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble, because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble, because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead for your sake. I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were, who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus again, greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, 
Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him, and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Again, at home, if you are standing, please be seated. And if you're seated, put your feet up. Someone told me this week that they were standing in their living room last Sunday when the Gospel was read, so she was very happy to be told to be seated. So you may all know that I am in charge of leading our young people toward confirmation in the church. And this is where those who have been baptized as wee ones, they get to a certain age and they claim their faith as their own. And the bishop comes and she lays hands on their heads and calls upon the Holy Spirit to guide them through life. We have met 12 times so far since the beginning of the fall. And one thing that has come up in our sessions together is the concern voiced by the group that these ancient stories in the Bible, well, they're, they're kind of irrelevant. I mean, who can relate to people walking around 2,000 years ago, shepherds and tax collectors and a crazy old man who built an ark, and, and on and on it goes. It's not really all that entertaining to a 15-year-old. And it's certainly not very relevant. And I don't think it's just our young people who might think that way. I think that often of us grown-ups, even though we would never admit it, I think sometimes on a Sunday morning we let the reading sort of float in one ear and out the other. We listen to them out of duty, wondering, what on earth does this have to do with me? And on some level, I must say I get it. Some of the Bible is kind of dry. Until I read the story this morning of a, land, a man laid in a tomb for four days. And I realized there are some powerful connections between that story and the current story that is rolling out in all of our lives right now. So I'm very happy that you've tuned in this morning. We have a chance to make some connections between these two, these stories, the story in the Bible and our life story, and to try and find some meaning in all, in all of this. Because when you can make meaning out of your circumstances, then there is hope. And if this makes any sense to you by the end of my sermon, you might want to forward the link on to a friend or a neighbor or someone you know who is feeling perhaps a little anxious and overwhelmed. Today's gospel story is about the raising of the dead man Lazarus, whom we are told was a dear friend of Jesus, who fell ill and lay dying. And his sisters, they summon Jesus to come and help. But he doesn't arrive in time. And when Jesus does finally arrive, 
There is much grief and disappointment and anger expressed by all. And the story comes to a climax where Jesus cried in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! Now, to truly lean into this story, we need to put our rational, logical minds aside. We need to become playful and imaginative with the story. Okay? Let's go. So there are all kinds of themes that we could explore in this story. But we're going to only look at two today. And actually two is a lot. This is actually two sermons that I'm trying to jam into one. We're going to look at the two. And we're also going to look at the notion of call and response. So let's begin with the two. When you think of a two, what comes to mind? As I sat with that image, the tomb, this week, after a while, I noticed how I began to feel kind of sick, a little tight in my chest and fluttery, a kind of a trapped feeling. And I couldn't decide whether it was from that exercise or from listening to the news each day. Certainly, both activities conjure the same feelings, as both deal with the issues of isolation, separation, death, darkness. And we could spend a lot of time unpacking all of these themes, but for the sake of time, because I know, I'm aware that you are very busy people, and you've got a lot of things to do today, and a lot of places to go, oh, Anyway, we're still, we're just going to look at darkness. And darkness, of course, is the opposite of light. Light, it symbolizes understanding, knowledge, wisdom, oh, like the light bulb going on in your head, a path, direction. If then you think of the darkness of the tomb, the tomb is a place, it's a physical place of not knowing. It's a state of being, of being in the dark, surrounded by mystery. And as creatures who like to feel in control of our lives, and for the most part, try to avoid those feelings of like free falling, mystery is not a comfortable place to be in. Unless you know that you can walk away from it, or you can close the book, or at least turn to the last page, or change the channel. Well, there's, my friends, there's no getting off this ride that we're on right now. There's no taking this book back to chapters for relief. So you might feel like you're kind of encased in a tomb. And not just physical confinement. For a lot of us, it's a heightened sense of vulnerability due to loss of income, loss of shelter, the possible loss of loved ones. And it's natural to want to escape from that place. Who wants to linger there? Who wants to lean into that? But the darkness and mystery of this place is not necessarily a place to recoil from. What if God is there? What if God is very close in that dark place? What if all that vulnerability and loss and brokenness is God? The Christian mystic St. John of the Cross in the late 1500s wrote The Dark Night of the Soul. And the unknown mystic author wrote 200 years before that of a cloud of unknowing. And both suggest that God can only truly be found in the darkest of places. Because in darkness, all of our competencies our talents, our strengths, 
All of our tools are taken away from us. And like the blind man on the path last week, like Lazarus in the tomb this week, desperation, poverty of spirit, they create in us the capacity to perceive and the capacity to listen. Which brings us to our next topic of exploration, call and response. There are a couple of people here today for our filming. The Lord be with you. And with you. Those of you who are visiting us today might be going, what? Well, that is a traditional Anglican thing to do, especially when you're trying to get people's attention at a meeting or at a potluck. But everyone has a version of that. The Canadian version is kind of like, hello, how are you? Oh, fine, thank you. Yo, what's up? Not much. Sick. I, I think that's the most up-to-date expression, but I'm probably already behind the times in saying that. I have to check with a 15-year-old. Call and response. It's a very divine act. And it's replicated, if you think about it, it's replicated in every life form on earth. It's the impetus behind life itself. Canada geese flying in formation in September. Okay, here we go. Ah, ah. That's my Canada goose imitation. Lost ones fly up to join responding to the call. The unfertilized egg released from the ovary in mammals sends out a biological kind of call on a cellular level, and sperm responds, swimming with intensity to meet up, to join, to create life. Lazarus, come forth. I wonder what it was like for Lazarus when he heard Jesus' voice from inside his tomb. Was it a far off echo? Jesus was a dear friend of Lazarus. So it would have been a familiar, albeit distant voice. And this scene is a snapshot of the Creator beckoning to the Creator, to the deeply loved, who is in a place of deep darkness and unknowing. Come, come this way. And there's something that is not said in this scene, but it is assumed that Lazarus is in fact listening. I mean, I find it mind-bending, but very comforting to think that even though Lazarus' body was dead, so dead, in fact, and I love this part where Martha informs Jesus, there's a stench dead for four days. But even in that state, he's still able to hear the voice of God. My friends, God called the world into being. He called to his people through the prophets. The Christian faith believes that God came to earth in the form of Jesus. The one who delights in creating life, called to life every person through Jesus' life and death and resurrection. God sent the Holy Spirit to guide the apostles, and to enable them to continue spreading the good news of God's love and calling the whole earth. And God continues to speak and call through the Bible. The story of Lazarus is an example of how living and active Holy Spirit, Holy Scripture is. As I said last week, and I'll say it again, God is calling his people today waiting for our response. Well, you might be thinking, well, God needs to speak a lot louder or sit next to me in the flesh. Then I listen. But if you look in the Bible, time and time again, if God spoke audibly and loudly, people recoiled rather than leaned into his voice. By the time of Jesus, they recoiled so much 
as to actually attempt to silence God through crucifixion. So no, we don't need God to call any louder. We need to develop our listening skills. I'm going to quote uh, an author of a book, a very favorite book of mine. It's actually the story of Lazarus, a, a commentary on the story of Lazarus. Joanna Weaver, she wrote, if we don't hear God speak, we won't be able to obey. And if we don't obey, we'll never escape our tombs. There is an art to listening for God. Number one, we have to anticipate it. You have to buy into the notion that God wants to speak to you and that he will speak. Believing that God is love and the nature of love is to express itself, whether through words or pictures or gestures. Sometimes in subtle ways that only the one he loves would recognize. So that's number one. We have to anticipate it. Number two, we must have a humble heart. Where are you willing to look? And what are you willing to hear? A humble posture of the heart believes that God makes the lowliest of appearances. And we might have to stoop in order to catch the moment. We have to anticipate it. We have to have a humble posture. And number three, we have to be willing to respond to what we hear. That's kind of the hard part. I have a standard poodle at home. Poodles are supposed to be the smartest breed of dogs. And he is. He is so smart when I say, come, I can tell. He's kind of, yeah, is there, is there a better option? We have to be willing to follow where we are being led wherever that may be? Are we willing to admit where we are wrong and align ourselves with what is right and good and true? So listening is not so much about spending time on your physical needs, knees and asking the right stuff in the right way. It is an internal posture, a constancy of intention. God, you want to speak? I'm ready to hear. Whatever it is you want to say, I'm ready to be transformed. The Spirit of God dwells in the heart of every believer, leading and guiding us into all truth. The Spirit of God is always confirming that we are indeed children of God and deeply loved. So my friends, we've got time on our hands for the next little while. And I propose that we, as the united body of Christ here, Christ Church, Brampton, and those who have stepped into our virtual doors today, I propose that we develop the following routine of deep spiritual listening over the next 14 days. And you don't need to write this down. I mean, feel free to, but this is going to be on the website. First, First thing, out of your mouth when you wake up, God, I invite you into my life today. And then, the next thing, before you turn on CBC for the latest COVID statistics and instructions on what we're allowed to do and not allowed to do, before you do any of that, I want you to sit up and fill your heart and mind with God's word. So you're going to need to keep a Bible by your bedside. Before you do anything. Now the psalm today that we sung is Psalm 130, 130. That's the psalm for the week. So tomorrow, I'd like you to read just the first verse. And then on Tuesday, read verse number two. And you're going to take one verse each morning this week and read it a few times, maybe two or three. What word stands out to you? Just pick one word. Write it on a piece of paper. And ask God why it is that this word in particular stands out. And then you're going to take this piece of paper with you as you move about your home during the day. Put a copy of it in the mirror. 
Put a copy of it by the kitchen sink next to your laptop. Take it out of your pocket at lunchtime and make it your word of thanksgiving or lament at meals. And then remain alert for different ways that God speaks to you that day. Remember God's message to you will be life affirming and it will be couched, it will be surrounded in buckets of love like a warm blanket. And anything other than that is not from God, so just toss it aside. Remember, God will never go against Jesus' message of love and forgiveness. So it's important to get familiar with the message of the gospel. And allow your response to God to be free-flowing. Tell God everything. Don't edit it, my friends. Let's get real with God right now. For the next 10 days, 14 days, the time for formalities is over. Allow God to be real with you. And here's the really tricky part, like my poodle has trouble with. Respond with obedience. March or stagger or crawl towards the divine voice. You may also be wondering how we recognize God's way of communicating. There are four methods of how the Holy Spirit communicates. Repeated themes. Like every wise parent, God repeats herself when we don't listen the first time. If the same topic keeps coming up, God is usually trying to tell me something. Like anger. For me, these days, it's impatience. I find myself impatient with myself and those around me. And I'm surrounded by people and events these days that make me so impatient. And that leads to anger. And on and on it goes. So perhaps God is talking to me about impatience. Impressions. An inner urge or prodding to do something or to look something up. It's hard sometimes to decide whether that our impulses are ourselves, our own impulses are God's. But often when we look back on it, we realize, oh, that was God. And confirmation. Scripture will confirm, will agree if it's God's word. And the confirmation from other brothers and sisters in Christ who are mature in faith. And it comes often with a sense of subtle peace. So I want to give you a quick example of something that actually, of two examples rolled in one, of God calling and speaking and how to listen. It's an intermingling of global listening and me listening. So I was driving into work on Monday, and I was thinking of my words already for you today. And I was asking God what he wanted to say to his beloved and then I was driving and I saw a neighbor walking her dog on the road. And so I, I pulled over and there was me, there was a driver's seat, there was her. So there was six feet, it's good. So we rolled down the window and we were chatting. And I was telling her that I was thinking that, isn't it interesting that we are fighting this enemy of COVID-19 by standing still. Staying still. And she corrected me. She read an article by an epidemiologist who said, we can only stay still for a matter of time. Organisms are clever. They will wait. They'll go dormant. They will transform and adopt and follow us. So we have to do something else. So disheartened, I, I drove on, and I turned on CBC. And Matt Galloway was interviewing two scientists, discussing the topic of vaccines as a means to fight COVID-19. And it was all, I got to tell you, it was sounding rather great. But Matt, God bless him, asked for a word of hope in all of this. And one of them responded, Labs around the world have always worked in isolation. Scientists, they never used to really communicate or collaborate with one another. And the borders between labs around the world have always been closed. But this pandemic, 
is forcing scientists and labs worldwide to open their borders, to be united and transparent, to act as one body. And this scientist was confident that scientific infrastructure is improving dramatically as labs around the world unite in their efforts. And such a change will better prepare us for future attacks. Now that resonates with the good news of the gospel. The world of science is listening and watching and responding to what I can only describe as the voice of God. And I think that prompted that chat with my neighbor, because I think he wanted me to share that story with you today, of transformation. I'm going to conclude with a starting point for you as you listen this week for the voice of God. This is a snapshot of God's loving call to us, actually God's response to our call, written by Henry Nouwen, master theologian, spiritual director. Long before any human being saw us, we are seen by God's loving eyes. Long before anyone heard us cry or laugh, we are heard by our God, who is all ears for us. Long before any person spoke to us in this world, we are spoken to by the voice of eternal love. Our preciousness, uniqueness, and individuality are not given to us by those who meet us in clock time, our brief chronological existence but by the one who has chosen us with an everlasting love, a love that existed from all eternity and will last through all eternity. Amen. Let's affirm our faith then in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father of Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting.
Into your hands we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. My sisters, my brothers in Christ, peace of the Lord be always with you.
Let us pray. Eternal God, your only Son, suffered death upon the cross to bring the world salvation. Accept the praise and thanksgiving we offer you this day. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. Now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that wherever two or three are gathered together in your name, you will hear their requests. Fulfill now our desires and petitions as we best, be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth, and in the world to come, life everlasting. For thou, our Father, art good and loving, and we glorify thee through thy Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, in the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. And now may the God of mercy transform you by his grace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be upon you and those you love and serve, this day and always. Amen. <laughs>